Hey guys, Ty here again for Guitar Gear One. Today we're going to take another look at my PRS Custom 24 in see-through black. I say another look because a few years ago I did a review of this guitar and at the time I made the video for a pretty specific reason and I didn't really explain that reason very well. So today I thought we'd do that. we take another look at the guitar, we're going to talk about it. I've had a couple more years with it so I have a few more thoughts and uh, well, let's see what you guys think. So thanks for coming back to the page and uh, let's do this. So like I was saying guys, this is another look at this guitar. Now, when I made that first video, when I said a lot of things about this guitar that sounded maybe, uh, you know, even, even belittling or really cocky or self-righteous or whatever, whatever it came off as, the reason I made that video, uh, this was, uh, I don't know, probably four, four or five years ago when I got this guitar. And I started finding all these like really elitist kind of guys that, you know, really seemed to feel that having a PRS was like the ultimate thing. And I'll tell you, man, there's a lot of guys that can buy a lot of things and it doesn't make any difference to how they play. And conversely, there's a lot of kind of fanboy stuff going on where a lot of people feel that, uh, you know, anybody that buys a PRS is great and, you know, PRS is the only thing and blah, 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 blah. And those guys probably really aren't that familiar with guitars. And the thing was, at the time, and after thinking about it, uh, not a lot of my favorite guitar players play PRS guitars. And so, I mean, I thought they're cool. I mean, they're the new kid on the block. They got some cool features going for them, stuff like that. But to me, honestly, at the time, I felt like they were kind of like a schlock rock, like Nickelback kind of dude guitar. You know what I'm saying? Uh, then something interesting happened. I had a friend of mine that bought one of the SE models. Uh, that, that's their uh, foreign manufactured CNC only, you know, uh, affordable line of guitars like LTD for uh, ESP or Square for Fender, however you want to think of it. Uh, so, he got one of these guitars and I played it and uh, if you're not familiar with this, Paul Reed Smith has gone with an unusual scale length. In fact, I'm going to call it a very unique scale length. Um, a Fender guitar is going to be 25 and a half inch. Uh, scale and a Les Paul style or Gibson style scale length is going to be 24 and 3 quarter inches. The Paul Reed Smith is smack in the middle. It's 25 inches even. Okay, so it's not as long as a Fender, it's not as short as a Gibson. How does this affect playability and tone and all that kind of stuff? Well, the longer you make a neck, okay, the more tension each string is placed under when it's put up to pitch. Okay, that affects how easily you can bend the strings, and it also affects the timber, okay, like the, the, the perceived pitch of a note. If you listen to a guy playing an eight-string guitar, um, if you haven't noticed, I'm a huge fan of Animals as Leaders. There's lots of guys that play eight-string guitars, and when you listen to an extended scale eight-string guitar that's 28 inches, 30 inches long, whatever it is, those strings are under so much tension, so even though from the sixth string down, that instrument is only tuned to like, you know, concert E, like regular standard guitar pitch. It has a sound to it that is so trebly and, and it just, uh, it did, uh, nothing else sounds like that, okay? So by reducing or lengthening a scale of a guitar, you're really affecting um, the brightness of it, okay? So a Les Paul is inherently uh, warmer or darker or whatever you want to call it, whatever you like to think of it as, uh, than, than something with a longer scale length like a Strat, okay? So, right off the bat, from the ground up, the PRS is built to have a different uh, playability and tone to it. So that's kind of cool. And if you like that, uh, it's nice. If, if a Les Paul seems a little small to you, uh, and a Strat, you know, maybe you wish it was a little bit smaller, well, PRS is right in the middle. Here's where it gets weird though. Um, this particular model has 24 frets, right? Custom 24. Uh, this is also available in 22 frets. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think the 22s, at least on the used market, are usually always a little bit cheaper than the 24 fret. Um, what happens is you're placing 24 frets in a space that, uh, uh, maybe is better suited to 22. In my personal opinion, that's all I can give you, and there's no right or wrong answer, this is just my thing, I do feel like the 24 frets are a little cramped. They are, to me, 
If you've got smaller hands, if you've been playing this for a long time and you're really, really used to it, it won't bother you at all. Muscle memory takes over. Uh, but uh, to me, when I play it, it does seem a little, uh, you know, cramped. So, even though a Les Paul does have a smaller scale length, it has fewer frets. So to me, uh, you know, it, it, it actually seems more substantial. And I think a Les Paul neck is a little wider than this neck is. So overall, a Les Paul neck to me does tend to feel more substantial than this neck does. It's not to say it's a bad neck. It's just, uh, well, it's a PRS neck for you. Um, so talking about the guitar, when I first started shopping for these, I didn't know what I was looking at. Because on uh, any other guitar in the world, you're going to have usually a volume knob and usually always a tone knob, right? Well, then I see this third one on a PRS and there's no pickup selector switch. And I, I didn't know what was going on and I didn't know anything about them at the time. Well, PRS has this rotary pickup selector system. So instead of having a traditional bladed, uh, like five-way strat style pickup selector or a three-way one, or a, uh, a toggle switch. It, it, they've gone with this rotary system. It has a total of five positions on the standard issue. And they've just put a regular speed knob on top of it. Uh, and it doesn't say one, two, three, four, five. It says one to 10, just like the volume and tone knobs do. It's the exact same knob. But uh, that's what that is. Okay, so you have a five position rotary pickup selector uh, for the PRS. So what that does, um, you know, you have your uh, neck and bridge humbuckers and uh, the forward position would be your neck pickup, second position uh, splits it, third position both pickups, fourth position split, bridge, and the rear position is of course the, the full power humbucker. Very straightforward once you get it, but one thing I will say is, and I've had this guitar for quite a few years, uh, I never remember what way is what. So like when I pick up the guitar like right now, I have absolutely no idea what pickup uh, selection is on right now. So like when I plug in this guitar, it's going to be a surprise to me. That might not always be cool to you. Uh, if you got a toggle switch that goes up, middle, and down, there is no two ways about which pickup you're on. Uh, so something like this, you know, might, might be a little bit of a liability to you. And what some guys would do is they will have this replaced with a regular uh, three-way uh, toggle switch and you can replace this tone potentiometer with a push-pull uh, switch so you can split your coils that way. It might work a little bit better for you if that's going to be a concern. I've obviously not uh, opted to swap mine out but uh, just so you're aware of that. Another interesting uh, aspect of the PRS guitar is their approach to finishes. And if I start to bore anybody here I apologize but I don't think I'm going to. Uh, PRS, I think you all know, is probably most known for the tops that they put on their guitars and their use of extremely figured woods, right? Uh, and it's not just the woods themselves, it's also how they've gone about finishing the guitars. Uh, on something like a Les Paul, okay, that's another very common uh, mahogany-backed, maple-capped instrument, you're going to find binding, okay? And that's plastic binding that is uh, drawn around the body of the guitar, a lot of times the neck, a lot of times the headstock. You'll see triple binding, it comes in different colors, etc. Uh, Smith had a new idea. Instead of actually, and I don't know this is original to him, and if anybody comes out and says, oh, well, there's this other company in the beer, 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 I don't know that. I don't know that. What I do know is that I think Smith was the first one that made it so big. So as an alternative to um, wrapping the body in plastic binding, he would actually mask off uh, the cap of the guitar and then apply the, uh, the colored finish. And when they're done with that process, they remove the tape back off the edges and you expose a natural binding. And I don't know how well you can see that from this angle, but we're gonna do some close-ups in a few. But what ends up happening is you have a unstained uh, perimeter around the cap of the guitar and it looks so cool. Very simple idea, uh, you know, it's almost a wonder that people didn't start doing this sooner, but it looks really, really, really cool. Uh, I appreciate that feature, and I know Schecter has begun doing that, and probably some other companies too. I had, I had a lower end, like $500, $600 Schecter years ago, 
that uh, had the same thing. Very cool idea. Now, I don't pretend to be any kind of an expert on this, okay? But what I've come to understand, and if I'm wrong, trolls, feel free to come out of the woodwork. But my understanding is that, and not on this guitar, this is not an example of this, but, but, but Smith has these, Paul Reed Smith has these very like hard candy looking uh, finishes on their guitars, right? You just these beautiful blues or reds or, or ambers or whatever. Um, and from what I've come to understand from my reading is that instead of staining the wood of the guitar itself, what Smith was doing was he was applying a clear coat of uh, clear coat to the top of the guitar and then applying pigments to the coats of clear that went over the top of it. So as light would shine through um, these layers of clear coat with, with the pigment inside of them, you're actually seeing that color being projected onto the wood of the guitar and that's what gives it that mirrored, you know, 3D, like extremely brought out finish. And I'm sure it's a combination of things that, again, I don't fully understand yet. But uh, I do know that guitar builders and experts uh, hold uh, Paul Reed Smith's guitars in very high regard for his finishes. His finishes were like revolutionary. Secondly, um, this is not one of them, but I think it was in 1993 that Paul Reed Smith guitars went to uh, CNC machines, whereas before that they were all hand done. And if you look at this, uh, the heel here on the neck, okay, this is, this is, it's not huge. It's not like, wow, you know, this big thing in your hand, but the earlier models were hand rounded and they were very small. So if you can ever find a good deal on an old one, like if somebody's dad had one under the bed and, you know, uh, he figures it's probably only worth a couple hundred bucks now because it's been so many years since, and that happens, man. I've bought guitars from people that have this mentality that, ah, it's old, it must not be worth anything anymore, and they have no idea. Uh, but anyway, if you can get your mitts on one of the older ones where you have the dough and you want a really special PRS, try to find one, 1993 or earlier, that's going to have that rounded, small heel. Okay, that's a cool thing to look out for. Uh, to me, the number one selling point regardless of the scale length or the finishes or anything else, okay? I love this tramp system. I really, really do, and here's why. Uh, if you've ever owned a Floyd Rose, you might have lied to yourself and said, I don't mind having to take care of this thing. I don't mind the 19 extra steps every single time I had to change a string or, or <laughs> the whole myriad of problems that comes with having one, and yes, I've owned them for years and years and years. I'll probably always have one around, but I'm never going to lie to you and say, that's my favorite trim system, and I would never change anything about it. Okay, because, yeah, I mean, it's a hassle. It just is. It'd be great to have one that just works. But uh, if you go to something like a Strat trim system, they don't stay in tune. Don't lie to yourself. Bigsby's, love them, sound awesome. Don't stay in tune. They just don't. And yeah, there's probably somebody out there that spent a ton of money and had a whole bunch of work done and did whatever. Super. I'm talking about regular old off the, you know, off the shelf stuff. It doesn't work that well. And that's just the reality of it. And, and if you've ever gigged for a long time, you're recording, you're doing whatever, you know, in your heart that you might bend that string and it might not come back in tune because that's the reality of those products. So, this trim is nuts because it almost is as flexible, almost, as a Floyd Rose. You know, you're not going to be able to do those like Herman Lee, like crazy, you know, grab the guitar by the trem arm and do all that nuts trem stuff. But you can get some big old pinch harmonic squeals, stuff like that, like a Floyd Rose. Uh, not have to deal with the double locking, but way more cool than that, way more cool than that is you can very gently just ease this trem up and down ever so slightly and get like pedal steel kind of stuff. If you play surf, if you're playing um, any kind of delicate, jazzy, bluesy, Spanishy sounding, ethnic sounding stuff, that is invaluable. This thing stays in tune better than any trem I've ever had. This guitar stays in tune better than my hardtail Les Paul.
guaranteed. This thing just doesn't go out of tune. It just does not. This trem is awesome. I would put this trem on every guitar I have if I could, and I'm not kidding. So, if that's not an endorsement, I don't know what is. Also, as far as premium features go, I was talking in my seven string guitar video about upgrades that you can do to Floyd Rose systems to make them sound better than they come stock. And one of the things I talked about is you can have a trem bar uh, that's made out of, not a trem bar like the trem arm, but uh, you know, the, the block, the trem block, sorry, uh, machine out of brass. And if you look inside your PRS, that sure looks like brass to me. I think every component on this guitar, it's pretty safe to say is a premium component. So there's some interesting methodology when you're looking at uh, concepts of building a guitar, okay? The PRS school of thought is a low mass headstock seems to produce the best tone. They have these low mass tuners okay, that are designed to retain very small amounts of string on, on, the, on the post itself when you're tuning it. The headstock is also just big enough to accommodate uh, the, the tuning post and, and to not look super freaky, you know what I mean? But, but the idea is they, they kept this headstock as minimal as possible. You see guitars uh, that are headless, like Strandberg guitars, uh, and then you have a completely, completely different train of thought on this. In fact, there's a product called the Fat Finger. I don't even know if they're still around. I remember them from the 90s. <clears throat> but it was a piece of metal, basically, that clamped onto the headstock of your guitar to increase its mass and to theoretically increase sustain consequently. Uh, if you read different guitar tech's suggestions, some guys will say leave a ton of string around the string post to increase mass, which increases sustain, and then you have other people that say, no, 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 I have no string on there, and whatever. And the thing is, man, so much of music, as far as the pursuit of tone goes, is this quasi-scientific shot in the dark. It just really, really is. And, and again, you know, everybody's trying to sound like something they've heard, whether it was on a record, or in their head, or wherever it was, if it was ever in reality at all, uh, you know, and, 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 and when you think of all the variables that go into someone's signature sound, Jesus, I mean, it never ends. It never ends. Uh, whether it's, it's, you know, oh, it's the capacitors, or it was the, the freaking bobbins. I have met guys, this is no joke, I have met guys that can tell you the different vendors that supplied companies like Gibson during different months in different years. They can say, yeah, well in 1954 there was a shortage from whatever company, so Gibson had to get their pole pieces from blah, 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 but then in the spring of blah, 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 it, and, and literally, I mean, they're, they're, they're talking about like screws, stuff like that, you know, like, oh, well they got them from wherever that one year, and that's why that guitar is amazing, and that's why it's worth another three grand. You know, we've all heard these kinds of stories. I don't know what to tell you other than to just practice your guitar, get good at guitar, you know, go from there. Uh, but, right, so uh, I think that's pretty much it for an overview of the guitar. Uh, you know, we've got the birds, got the rosewood board. Uh, what else can I say? Why don't we play the thing for a while? So before we start playing here, I just, I just really want to say this. Uh, you know, overall, uh, this is probably the most uh, reliable guitar I've ever had. Like, I wouldn't really hesitate to bring this thing anywhere. Um, you know, the, the, the pickups are hot enough that even for an extreme style of metal, I don't think you'd feel uh, underpowered. Uh, and yet they clean up so well that, that I, I, you know, if you had to sit in at a jazz gig, any kind of blues, any kind of classic rock, there's just really nothing tonally that this guitar wouldn't be, uh, you know, inappropriate for. Uh, and aesthetically too. I mean, it just, it's so versatile looking of a guitar. And what I mean is like, if you showed up at a blues gig, guys would be like, oh, that's so pretty. That's so pretty. You show up at a metal show and people would be like, oh, that's so badass, you know, or whatever. Uh, and it's, it's just cool that way. It really, really is. It's like a modern classic, you know? So, uh, they're not cheap, man, you know? And that, that's kind of the thing. And that's what I was getting at. You know, when these guys are sending me these emails like, oh, you got a, you got a PRS, and I got a PRS, and we're in the PRS club, you know, like, like, like we all had, like, letter jackets or something. It really did. It kind of made me sick. I'm like, you know what, man? Like, that's not, that's, 
to me, that's not really what guitar is supposed to be. I don't want to be some like West Coast, like, you know, sleazy rock star looking dude. Um, but if you don't make the guitar that, it isn't. You know what I mean? Like, just love it for what it is. I guess is all I was trying to say in the first video, right? So anyway, <clears throat> we're going to do some playing. We're going to start off on the, uh, the neck pickup and uh, just kind of show you how it sounds. We're going to start off with the tone rolled all the way up and uh, we'll, just, we'll just start noodling around a little bit. And 
I don't know how well that comes through with the compressor on my camera, but it really sounds a lot better strumming full chords. <laughs> to like pick it apart. too thin, but uh, with the tone all the way up, uh, you know, we're getting pretty close. So lastly, we have the, uh, uh, got the bridge pickup for you. some clean stuff, but let me show you the whole freaking point of owning one of these guitars. And my brother does this way better than me, our guitar player Mike does this way better than me, and I, I stole it from Dylan, my, my younger brother. I mean, he's got this really cool Spanish approach to guitar, this like floaty, cool thing, and I'm going to try to fix it right now, but this... Okay, I want you to just watch this. <clears throat> this is kind of tricky to do sitting down, believe it or not. I can just touch this trim. Look at that. I mean, I'm talking about just barely. You hear that? You're not going to ever do that with a strap. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, you, you, you can get this vibrato. Very pedal steely, you know? Like any any strat that I ever played, the, the 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 bridge itself is like clamped to the body of the guitar and to initiate that initial you know little pull, I mean you gotta really the shot and you're never gonna get it so touch sensitive as as this is. You know what I mean? tram system on these things and just, you know you should really take advantage of that if you got it around uh, so uh, that's about what all I wanted to cover for clean so uh, let's do some distortion so we're gonna start off on the uh, bridge pickup for the distorted stuff and we're just gonna kind of crash over a few general things and see what you think <laughs>
a noise gate and my amp that just kicked in there. But but again, I just wanted to hear how uh, how well the guitar does sustain. Uh, give it just a little more juice than that, you know. And I, I, I'm just so used to having so much gain, but uh, let's do a little note separation test stuff. <laughs> side and uh, get that neck pickup going and play basically the exact same thing so you get a difference. <laughs> And these, these, these definitely got that, uh, that honk in them, you know, which is cool, especially if you're playing more rock and roll. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to twist back up to the, uh, to the neck, excuse me, <clears throat> go back down to the bridge position, see, uh, see how a pick attack is. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
fine. It just isn't. It's not awful, you know what I'm saying? But but it, for that searing lead. <laughs> Rips, rips. So, uh, yeah. If you guys want to see anything else with it, let me know. You know, just kind of doing the usual. Doing the usual. And this is a second look at this guitar, so I don't want to spend too too much time with it. But uh, yeah, let's do some close-ups and uh, show her to you. All right, guys. Here's the most brightly lit close-up I could possibly get of this thing. Uh, and again, I mean, you, you got to really blast it with some serious, serious light to get, uh, you know, this much detail out of it. So, you know, it uh, it, it, it kind of looks black from far away. Uh, but uh, as you can see, there's definitely a maple cap on top of this guitar, and it's a, it's a pretty nice one at that. Uh, <clears throat> this is not a 10 top. Okay, it's the regular, regular issue Paul Reed Smith Custom 24. Um, if you don't know, uh, Paul Reed Smith guitars are available what's called 10 tops. 10 top is an upcharge for a top that has been rated a 10 by the good people at Paul Reed Smith and uh, it guarantees that you will have a superb top. Now I don't have a 10 top. What does that mean? Uh, <laughs> and even under all this lighting there is uh, 2,000 watts of light uh, on this guitar right now, and I'm not kidding. Um, if you can see in here, it looks like somebody took like just brown chalk. They don't make brown chalk, but if they did, that's what it looks like they did. And they just uh, wishy-washed brown uh, across the top. Let's see what we can do for you. Maybe you can see it. And again, it, it, it's like one of those like from certain angles things, like from this angle it looks like we might actually be getting it to come out. But it's like, uh, like, like melted chocolate got underneath the clear coat and it got finished in there like one of those mosquitoes in the amber in Jurassic Park and it's never coming out. So, uh, yeah, I do not have a perfect top on my PRS guitar. That's totally fine because I got a steel on this thing. So there. Um, yeah, just giving you a good overview. And again, here's a shot of that natural binding. Uh, let me get not so directly in that light. And if you get a good shot of the edge, you can see how well the flame or the figure is defined in that um, natural binding. And I think that is just like the coolest part of it. I really, really do. I love this stuff. I think it was a great idea. Very cool. Very interesting. Um, of course, these bird inlays are the hallmark of PRS guitars. You know, they've now gone to the hollow ones, and I'm told that that helps them save some money in production, which, you know, basically means you're getting less product for the money, which you can think of that however you like. I'll think of it however I like. But uh, this is the non hollowed out version of the birds. And by the way, I didn't mention it before, this trem arm, uh, unlike a Floyd Rose or Strat style or so many other styles, it just uh, pops right in and out. It's completely unthreaded. Uh, you know, when you want it, you just pop it right in. When you don't, yank it right out. So I'm going to set that aside for just a second. I'll show you the back. And again, this guitar is super susceptible to paw prints. Uh, I was only playing it for See that? I was only playing it for a little bit and uh, it's already all funkified and uh, I did polish it up before the video. See there on the upper horn? If you, if you touch this guitar at all, uh, yeah, you're going to have uh, proof all over it. So not a very thick guitar, as you can see, um, you know, the actual body thickness itself. Um, doesn't weigh very much, very comfortable, you know, you could really play this thing all night with uh, with no uh, laboriousness on your shoulder. No discomfort that way. Painted back, uh, painted back of neck. 
It's not a raw finish neck. Some people really like that, some people don't. I don't really mind it. Uh, and as you can see, it is hand numbered at the top, which is pretty cool. So at least somebody was involved in the making of this guitar. So, uh, anyway, that's a good look at the Paul Reed Smith Custom 24. So anyway, hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you come back for more Guitar Gear 1. Thanks, everybody.